exposing uh, more people to it and to contact the folks that I may have come in contact with to let them know what's going on to get them in to get them tested. So it's um, it's something we've learned so much about sexually transmitted diseases are just being around that program. Um, and, and if I could quickly interject too, I may be doing this all night, I don't know, but because I've had guests from, from the Volusia County Health Department on, that to say to people, don't count on that though, because there are some people who have made it their life's purpose to go out and spread certain diseases, and, uh, and they may not give the name, which means that just because, you know, they're checking with all these people, but, uh, and it's confidential, uh, you may still be exposing yourself to something, you know, if you go in there and you have uh, sex unprotected. So to all of our people, you know, whether you're young or you're old, there is that possibility, and you really don't want to, uh, to find yourself waiting too long and then too late uh, to try to, uh, to take care of the situation, even if you suspect they can come and check, right? You should definitely um, use protection. Uh, use condoms, use, um, you know, just use protection and also be very, very concerned about who you're sleeping with mm -hmm. and um, talk to your doctor. Um, just do everything associated with taking care of yourself and um, it's definitely not a good idea to um, know that you're, you're impacted, to know that, that you're infected and to turn around and infect others unknowingly. So, so that is not um, the kind of behavior, that's actually risky behavior. So um, that's why our disease intervention specialists are on the front line, and they handle um, they handle this situation quite well. And also, we have a number of services. So I'll just briefly mention some because I know you want to get into the, the meat of the uh, the uh, health equity mm -hmm. issue. Um, so women's health services, obviously, um, and then we also have environmental health, and that's the program we you mentioned, testing the water. Uh, we're here to make sure the water that you drink is safe. Like you may not have a second thought. You'll just go to that water fountain and get that swig of water, and um, it's programs like the one we have at the health department that um, ensures that we're making sure that, that you're getting a, a tasty um, a good, safe mm -hmm. drink of water. And also we're, we're doing the um, testing of the, the oceans. We have the Healthy Beaches Program. We have so many tourists that are coming from all around the world right. to enjoy the beautiful beach, Daytona Beach. And you want to make sure that our beaches are safe. And then if we test the water and if we feel like the bacteria levels are too high, then we would issue the uh, swimming advisory and just um, ask folks not to swim um, mm -hmm. in that particular uh, approach at that particular time. And we continue to test it until the results come out and they're good levels, and then you know, we'll lift those advisories. But um, you mentioned where we were located. We're in, we have four public health clinics. We're in Deltona, New Smyrna Beach, Daytona Beach, and Deland. We also have dental clinics for, for the kids, and the dental clinics are in Daytona Beach and Deland. So we have a staff, a trained staff of our professionals. Um, we're well led, Dr. Bonnie Sorensen, as well as Dr. Celeste Phillip. And then um, we, we actually have another assistant director as well, Patricia Sturm. And, and just a host of um, health professionals who are on the front line. And you think about our nurses, and I'm looking at Dr. Um, Dixon, because Dr. Dixon has that nursing background. And you think of nurses, and you think of public health nurses. Now these folks could be, you know, apply at the Halifax and the uh, Florida Hospital and make much, much, much more. But they're just so dedicated to public health that you know they work for uh, you know meager wages uh, <laughs> as a state employee because they care. Right, you know, right. and, and they in one program we do is immunization. You know, our immunization nurses care. They don't want the youngsters to get into the community or mm -hmm. get in the classroom and spread diseases. So they're on the front line to stop the spread of the diseases, to help the youngsters get vaccinated or uh, whatever we need them to do. So nursing is just so important. I mean, the doctors are special, but the nurses, the real public health nurses as well as, you know, just any nurse is um, when you're on your back in that hospital and you don't have anyone else to care for you, you're glad to see that nurse, aren't oh, you? absolutely. So um, we, we're, we're um, proud to have our nurses and to know all about nurses. My older sister was a nurse. She's retired now. She was a nurse in, in New York. And um, she, she always had stories. 
they're just a special type of healing. They are. They are. For people it's a special the way they calling. Do. It is a special calling. And I would just piggyback on one other thing you said about state employees, government employees, because you know they're taking <laughs> such a hard licking now. Uh, as the persons or the groups that they point to whenever there's anything wrong with government or anything else. And, uh, you know, the, the, the shots that they take saying that they, they earn too much money and this, that, and the other. Uh, that has rarely ever been the case. Now, you know, top level people, who knows. But uh, when it comes to those that have their feet on the ground, those that are actually providing uh, you with services, listeners, In and the all of us. Yes, yes, yes. Those individuals are not highly paid. In fact, I remember a study that was done that said that uh, at the time, a Department of, um, uh, it was the HRS, which is now Department of Children and Families, that many of those employees didn't qualify for food stamps. Yes. You know, uh, based on their income. So there are uh, public servants out there that are providing services to all of us and to those in need in particular, uh, young and old families uh, the, and the like who uh, really are not those well-paid uh, vultures as people try to make them out to be. And they are deserving of your respect. They are also deserving of, um, you know, whatever praise we can, we can really uh, lay on them and, and attribute to them uh, because it does take a special calling to be a public servant. I know there are some who've lost sight of the fact that that's what they are, but for the majority of people, you know, we're talking about the greater majority of people who are public service. They understand what it means, and they have that passion and that love, and that's why they continue to do it. Uh, Dr. Dixon, yes. uh, tell them uh, your title, um, what uh, uh, center it is that you're associated with, and uh, about the services that are provided there, and then we'll get into the inequities. But uh, I know I had someone I actually call your office who, who asked the question about the center and the hours and what it was that exactly that you guys provided there. So, well, first of all, um, I do want to just go back and say I put an absolute exclamation point when you said that the school of nursing is one of the best in the country. <laughs> so, since I spent a great deal of my time being dean of the school of nursing and I'm a dean, very proud of that program. And that's that, the, the great. The, well, it's at Bethune Cookman University. Bethune <laughs> Cookman <laughs> University. Uh, the, um, if you were mentioning, currently I am uh, just been recently promoted by our new interim president, Dr. Edison Jackson, to the position of associate provost oh. for health, equity, and civic engagement. Wonderful. Hey. And, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> Largely um, because of two things. One is because of the work that we had accomplished at the Odessa Chambers Wellness Center, and I will come back to that. Mm -hmm. But also because of Dr. Jackson's larger vision of how do we take what is the legacy of our founder, Dr. Bethune, and move that legacy into making a real inroads and an impact in the community as far as civic engagement, real impact. So when you look at the work of the Odessa Chambers Wellness Center, I must say it was named for one of our alumni, Lucille O'Neill, her mother who was a nurse. Um, the Wellness Center does not provide clinical services because we have many wonderful community partners who do that. The Volusia County Health Department, the local hospitals, they provide clinical services. But what is missing is what you alluded to earlier, and that is people being able to have information that they could use mm -hmm. and knowing what the services are. So the real mission of the Wellness Center is to be a, a real hub for health literacy. When meaning quite simply that without being able to understand what services are available, the true meaning of what your treatment options are, that to understand the consequences of your illness, without that real information, you can't be an active participant in your own care. Mm -hmm. So we really saw it started out to being a center or a hub for health literacy. That grew because of the citizens where the, the um, university sits in that 32114 zip code. And recognizing that the citizens in that area really were people that represented a disparate health group. Meaning quite simply that there was a larger number of not only chronic illnesses, but the 
complications of chronic illness. So that you have not only a great number of people with diabetes, but you also have a large number of people with amputations, loss of eyesight, and a lot of that can come back again to that health literacy issue. Mm -hmm. So the mission of the Wellness Center, and one in which we proudly embrace and have done a real good job, is really looking at helping people to understand how do you address the in inequality in morbidity and mortality from disease. And diseases, like I mentioned, like heart disease, um, Stephanie knows what's close to my heart, and that's infant mortality, because I do have a granddaughter who was born at two pounds, two ounces, and I know what it's like to visit a uh, neonatal intensive care unit and see a little one struggle for life. Well, I'm very proud to say she is now 30 some more pounds and has taken the world by storm. And I recognize the importance of God's blessings and a miracle. But I really, that charged me to recognize that what is it that we're doing that so many of our young African American babies are born either too early or too soon and just don't make it. So we start, we do programs around infant mortality. On the other end of the spectrum of coming into this world, leaving this world, we have too many African Americans who do not avail themselves of hospice services. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we, they are wonderful services and they don't recognize even the new hospice when you can go on and off of hospice. So they don't have those services at the really being able to make good at the end of life decisions. So we really cover the whole spectrum and what is it that we can help people within that community, including our own faculty, students, and staff, being able to address health disparities. Well, with that in mind, I can go right on. My title is Health <laughs> Equity. Um, and you know, there is a misconception. When you talk about health, people try to define health as the absence of disease. Mm -hmm. Health is much more than that. It is the ability, really, to live your life to the full potential and not be impacted by your social status, your gender, the things you mentioned earlier, right, right. gender, ethnicity, to be able to live life to the full, full potential. And that's what we really are trying to make some inroads in. And when we think of health equity or health inequity, we tend to think of health disparities, which I've mentioned. We think in terms of the social determinants of health, that's Dr. Philip, that is her area of expertise. <laughs> But, and when you talk about social determinants, a prime example, we can say to people, you know, what you need to do is you can go out and walk as an exercise. You can walk and that's a cheap exercise, you don't have to go out to a gym. Well, let me tell you, it's not always easy to walk around that area. Mm -hmm. Some areas don't have um, sidewalks, I've walked it. Right, don't right. have sidewalks, the sidewalks are on right. either. That's right, so that's a social determinant of health, that's your, how your environment impacts your health. And then, um, under Dr. Dr. Jackson's urging, we're also looking at what are issues related to social justice. And I know Stephanie can talk a great deal about what Pace the age and some of the programs that the health department have looked at when they've got focus groups together. And people have talked about, well, my health is also impacted by the fact that I live in an area in which there's violence. Mm -hmm. When it's not only violence, where that you know issues related to racism and sexism affects my health. And those things we usually think of under the heading of social justice. So what we're planning to do, well, Dr. Jackson has had said in several years, as I mentioned to his met Dr. Eaton. Um, but on September 19th, we're bringing together many of the community stakeholders and asking them, all right, we've been talking about this for a long time. What are we ready to now roll up our sleeves and get to doing something about the issues? And that's, that, that is just the first meeting that he's going to have in a series of meetings in which we really want to be able to move in and say to our students, we have meaningful service learning opportunities for you out there meaningful opportunities where you not only go out and try to transform the community by your actions, but you as an individual student will be transformed also. Mm -hmm. That you will recognize the importance of being an active participant as a citizen, the things that you were mentioning, Absolutely. that it is so important. So through the process of service learning as it's geared around health disparities, social determinants of health, and social justice, we, learn, we will be igniting, again, Dr. Bethune's legacy, where she talked in terms of entering to learn, so that our students truly will enter 